Operation Audi R8 has become fiercer and more focused in this improved form, with enhanced versions of a 5.2 litre V10 engine that now provides near supercar levels of performance. There are dynamic changes along with styling updates, and as before, you'll choose between coupe and open top spider variants. Plus, of course, there's quattro four wheel drive that makes this a super sports car for all seasons and all reasons. There was a time when some in the industry questioned the super sports car credentials of this model, the Audi R8. They no longer do that now, and we're going to find out why at the wheel of the revised version of this second generation model. They say that success breeds success, but the reality is that it breeds expectation. Back in 2006, Audi commemorated victory in the Le Mans 24-hour race by launching its very first super sports car, the R8. And that original Type 42 design surpassed almost everyone's expectations by nailing the junior supercar brief first time out. It was the first contender in years to properly scare the benchmark player in the segment, Porsche's 911, something that models from BMW, Mercedes and Jaguar had been trying to do for decades. With this second generation Type 4S model first launched back in 2015, the brief was subtly different. Audi wanted to charge more for the R8, and that meant it also had to be able to credibly challenge really exotic super sports car models like Aston Martin's Vantage and McLaren's 570S. Ingolstadt might not have quite the badge credibility of brands like those, but its contender still has something that those famous marks no longer offer, the kind of old-style, normally aspirated engineering that always used to make cars like these so special. The turbocharged engines that all other contenders in this segment now use are efficient and extremely powerful, but there's still nothing quite like the sort of high revving, normally aspirated unit that gets one last outing in this facelifted Mark II R8, a car announced at the end of 2018. As before, it's a 5.2 litre V10 offered in two states of tune and mated to a seven speed dual clutch paddle shift gearbox. But with this improved car, increases in both power and torque push all variants over the 200 miles an hour barrier for the first time. Audi's also tweaked the suspension, the steering and the drive modes while also introducing a subtle facelift for both available body styles, this coupe and the alternative open-topped spider model. As before, the basic engineering formula here is shared with Lamborghini and with the R8 LMS GT3 race car that rolls down the same Audi Sport GmbH production line as this road version. What we've got here is the fastest and most powerful Audi ever made, a triumph on a track that claims to be a revelation on the road. Time to put it to the test. All the ingredients are here for a world-beating sports car. Relatively lightweight, an agile chassis, and a proper mid-mounted configuration for a glorious throbbing engine. But where Porsche and the exotic Italian brands have had nearly 50 years to blend those things into world-beating perfection, Audi had to start from a clean sheet at the turn of the century with the R8. In the original version, that didn't seem to matter. It was brilliant. Uh, the second generation model, though, is a pricier, more powerful thing, a bona fide junior supercar, which these days has a much tougher set of rivals to beat. Is it up to the challenge? Well, you can't help thinking so once you press the red starter button on the steering wheel. Well, listen to that. If it's drama you're after, then this power plant delivers it. Uh, the engine in question is a 5.2 litre, normally aspirated V10. Audi spurning the current trend towards turbocharging that even Ferrari has found impossible to resist. It'll scare small animals and children, it'll infuriate your neighbours, and it's exactly the kind of sound that a car of this sort should make. 
Because of the engine's lack of forced induction, it's inevitably necessary to venture much higher up the rev range, typically well over 6,000 RPM to wring out everything it has to give, but that's no hardship with a power plant that's this charismatic. As before, with this Mark II uh, Type 4 SR8, the V10 comes in two states of tune, but with this revised model, uh, both versions of this classic unit get increases in power and torque that push all variants through the 200 miles an hour barrier for the first time. Plus, there are changes to the steering, suspension, uh, the drive mode settings, and the braking performance. We'll start with the power updates. The base derivative now puts out 570 PS, that's 30 PS more than before, and that's enough in coupe form to make a rest to 62 miles an hour possible in 3.4 seconds on the way to 201 miles an hour. The faster performance model that we're trying here offers 620 PS, that's 10 PS more than before, which in coupe form sees uh, 62 dispatched in 3.1 seconds on the way to 205 miles an hour. This performance model's 580 newton meter torque figure is 20 newton meters up on that of the old V10 Plus R8 variant it replaces. Uh, the base V10 gets a lesser 10 newton meter increase to 560 newton meters. As a result, if you were lucky enough to be able to drive these two derivatives back to back, it'd be probable that you'd conclude uh, that the subjective power difference between the two models would have widened slightly. Either way, acceleration remains concussive uh, to the accompaniment of a V10 note with a sound and fury that's real and authentic rather than artificially processed through a sound actuator as the amplified exhaust note is on Audi's lesser sports car, the TT. Sadly, it's no longer possible for R8 owners to embellish the oral fireworks by specifying a sports exhaust. That was a casualty of tightening emissions regulations, but the standard pipes are quite tuneful enough uh, to deliver a satisfyingly exotic melody, particularly if you've opted for the most focused of the available drive select modes, dynamic. In a class where some rivals seem to have more drive settings than you can shake a stick at, it does now seem rather quaint for the base R8 to offer just two, comfort being your commuting alternative uh, to dynamic. Uh, the way that this pair of options alter throttle response, steering, stability control thresholds, and gear shift timings has uh, now been differentiated rather more distinctly as part of the changes made to this revised model. And as before, there is also an auto setting if you can't decide, plus there's an individual option if you want to configure all the individual elements to suit your personal preferences. Uh, go for this V10 performance variant and you get more choices uh, as here Audi has added in an extra performance mode and that's apparently intended for track use but of course uh, you'll probably want to play with this at every opportunity. Uh, through this you're given further dry, wet and snow sub modes. Uh, each one of those is selectable from this uh, smaller satellite control just below the main drive select button. The other thing that Drive Select can influence is ride and suspension, although it will only be able to do that if you've paid extra for the pack that gives you the brand's clever Audi Magnetic Ride Damper Control System. Uh, given the inherent firmness of the sport suspension package, which is now non-negotiably fitted right across the range, Magnetic Ride is a feature that's well worth having. It allows you to focus your R8 when you're in the mood and to dial it right back when you're not. Now, that's important uh, given that Audi wants this model to be capable of the kind of daily driving lifestyle that you just wouldn't want to put up with in an Italian supercar. Hence, a level of urban maneuverability that uh, belies the relatively low seating position and this second generation designs considerable width too. All from a super sports model that uh, must still, when it's called upon, be able to deliver brutal performance, tremendous traction and astonishing agility. 
does it? Well, the speed sensation we have already touched on. Uh, there's launch control to fire you off the line with a flex of your right foot, uh, which sends the rev needle shooting around the color changing rev counter that you get in performance mode. I mean, if this isn't flashing red as a steering wheel paddle shifters change up, then you're just not trying hard enough. Um, this performance model's power and torque increases. Uh, they come courtesy of new titanium valve train componentry and you can really feel the difference as the gauge flares up to the 8,700 RPM red line and then never strays more than 2,000 RPM from it as the twin clutch seven speed S-Tronic paddle shift gearbox throws ratio after short stacked ratio with rifle crack speed and the car just hurls itself at the horizon with animal savagery. It's just as well then that it stops with equal ferocity. Uh, internally ventilated, perforated and floating brake discs are fitted to the standard V10 model. Uh, these featuring a distinct wave pattern for improved air circulation and anti-fade properties. Nevertheless, fade they will after repeated track use, uh, at which point you'd rather be in an R8 fitted with a set of ceramic stoppers. Now these come as standard on this performance variant that we're driving today. And thanks to the changes made to the car's electronic stability control software, they're even more affected than before. They stopped the car 1.5 meters earlier from 62 miles an hour and five meters earlier from 124 miles an hour. As for the corners, well, it turns, it grips, and it goes, courtesy of the kind of four-wheel drive system that rivals from Mercedes, McLaren, and Aston Martin will make you do without. Ingolstadt has also developed a rear-wheel drive version of this car, but we don't really understand why you'd want that unless you spend your life with your R8 on a track, in which case uh, you'd be better off buying something like a Porsche 911 GT3 or a Mercedes AMG GTR. In the real world, this Audi's Quattro system is a much better partner for this model's prodigious reserves of power. Uh, as before, it's able to flash 100% of torque to either axle instantly on demand. Plus, of course, you get the expected torque vectoring system that deals with tight turns at speed by dialing out understeer and channeling power to the wheels that can best use it. The result of all this is a level of traction that's so high that anyone starting to approach this car's limits on a public road will quickly make themselves a target for the local constabulary. Uh, more relevantly, at fast but still sensible speeds, it all delivers instant confidence when it comes to unleashing around 600 PS on a twisting country road, particularly in changing conditions. And that's something that, in our experience of driving super sports cars, only Porsche's 911 can replicate. As for agility, well, that's aided in this revised model by subtle changes that Audi Sport has made to the double wishbone suspension uh, to give the car a little extra stability. Carbon pack versions of this performance model uh, further benefit from a special front anti-roll bar fashioned from CFRP, that's carbon fibre reinforced plastic, to save two kilos in weight. Now, this stabiliser's purpose is to stiffen the spring and damper combination for more direct contact with the road and sportier handling. To be frank, we'd have preferred it if the engineers had instead spent more time in improving the electrical steering. Uh, the rack used here features various software changes aimed at delivering greater precision, but still lacks the final touch of feel that transforms the driving experience of a rival high-powered Porsche 911 from being merely good to feeling absolutely great. As rivals have found, adding in an optional speed variable steering setup doesn't solve that problem. In fact, it arguably exacerbates it. Now, Audi has developed such a system too, dynamic steering, but for our market, they only fitted it to a limited run Decanium variant that quickly sold out. Launch event driving feedback suggested the dynamic setup to be a better aid for low speed changes of direction, but that the standard system has a weightier, more consistent feel for both road and track use. Either way, it's clear to us that Audi's engineers need to learn from Porsche here. 
that apart, we're finding it very hard to criticize this car. Uh, in the period since we first tried the second generation version of this model back in 2015, uh, we've driven exceptionally talented and more recently developed key rivals from Porsche, Aston Martin, uh, Mercedes and McLaren. In contrast, we worried that this Type 4S version of the Audi might have lost a little of its earlier magic. But instead, as the miles have clicked by, uh, we've been reminded all over again just why we loved it in the first place. Aside from steering feel at the helm, it definitively nails the junior supercar brief in almost every verifiable regard. Um, it's easy to acclimatize to, it's free of nasty habits, and it's hourly awesome. As for the changes made to this revised model, well, if you had your eye on something else in the segment, it's unlikely that the improvement package will be enough to sway you out his way, uh, particularly given the fact that the brand hasn't taken the opportunity to update this car's virtually non-existent camera-driven safety and autonomous driving technology. But if you already wanted an R8, well, then the updates uh, made here will certainly sharpen your desire for ownership. Track day worries, well, they might prefer something else, but uh, for someone who's seeking something for everyday use that will one day ease the transition into a fully-fledged exotic supercar, well, one of these might be just about perfect. Visually, the R8 remains much as it always was, a distinctive cocktail of low-slung curves and delightful design extravagance. Although the arrival of this Type 4S second generation design in 2015 saw the influential shape of the previous Mark I Type 42 series model expressed in a tauter, more technically precise way. As before, we're talking Ferrari, but with a German twist. Now, whether you think Audi should have more fundamentally changed the appearance of this car over the years comes down to personal perspective. Um, aesthetic continuity certainly hasn't done Porsche's 911 any harm over the last half a century. This model doesn't have that one's uh, understated elegance, but whether you choose either the coupe body style we have here or the spider convertible, it looks appropriately exotic and exclusive just as a six-figure supercar should. If you happen to be familiar with the original version of this Mark II R8, you'll immediately notice the changes that Audi has made as part of the midterm refresh. The single-frame radiator grille has a wider, flatter line. The corner air inlets have been restyled. There's a revised front splitter, and these three flat slits under the leading edge of the bonnet are supposed to be reminiscent of the iconic 80s Audi Ur Quattro model. In short, you would perhaps be more likely to notice an R8 now, although not necessarily for the right reasons. Uh, in profile, these large side blades bisected on this second generation model by this flowing shoulder line uh, continue to be the car's most distinctive feature and the easiest identifier of the R8 variant you're looking at. With the base V10, they're finished in Mythos Black, uh, while this V10 performance derivative gets them in matte titanium or optionally in race style carbon fiber. On the right-hand side here, uh, the top part of the blade surrounds this lovely motorsport-style aluminium fuel lid, while the upper part of the bottom section forms a starting point for a dramatic mid-level crease that flows up towards the door mirrors. Uh, the door handles are almost invisibly positioned in that shoulder line shadow, while lower down, uh, the light edges on the side sills have been fashioned to echo those of Audi's Le Mans winning R18 e-tron Quattro race car. Uh, the wheels, they're another R8 variant identifier. 19 inches are fitted to the standard V10 and bigger 20 inch rims feature on the performance models. At the rear, there are two key model identifying features. The base V10 gets a retractable spoiler and chrome finished exhaust outlets, while this performance variant features this huge gloss carbon trimmed fixed spoiler, which helps to generate up to 140 kilos of downforce and gloss black trimmed tailpipes. Actually, in both cases, the exhaust outlets are merely decorative. The real pipes are hidden away beneath the plastic trim used for the lower diffuser that on this revised model has been drawn upwards at each corner in a bid to make the car appear wider. Uh, if you glance above the spoiler through this rear glass and as ever with an R8, there is 
the pièce de résistance, the enormous 5.2-litre V10 engine sitting in its own illuminated bay like a work of art in a display case. Of course, as ever, what really matters is the stuff that you can't see. Now, back in 2015, the switch from the original Type 42 series design to this uh, second generation Type 4S model saw the R8's lightweight ASF Audi space frame aluminium construction uh, strengthened with an even more advanced material, carbon fiber reinforced polymer. Now that reduced the car's weight by 32 kilos and it also contributed to a 40% improvement in torsional rigidity. Getting in isn't as easy as it would be in a 911 and these very long doors can make it difficult to get in and out of the car if you happen to have parked in a particularly tight space. Still, it is possible to enter in a more graceful manner than is the case with most models of this kind. And once inside, where there are almost no changes over the original version of this Mark II Type 4S model, you're introduced to what Audi calls a luxury level racing atmosphere. Now, whatever that means, this is certainly an interior that remains an object lesson in how to package a two-seat sports car. Now, it's true you don't get the exotic feel of a Ferrari or a Lamborghini here, but personally, I think we'd trade that for the extra space, the fantastic build quality and the better all-round visibility provided by an R8. Audi is much better at ergonomics than most of its rivals too. Uh, you can't, for example, ever imagine an Ingolstadt designer ever putting the indicators onto the steering wheel in the irritating way that they are on a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. You sit higher than you would in cars of that sort and also higher than you would in a comparable McLaren. So the view out is nearly, but not quite, as commanding as it would be in that 911 model that we keep mentioning. Uh, as usual with any R8, one of this cockpit's key distinguishing features is what the stylists call the monoposto. That's this stylized large arc that encircles the driver's area of the cockpit, starting here at the door and ending in the center tunnel. Uh, there's a grippy, flat-bottomed, three-spoke performance steering wheel with lower circular satellite controls. There's a red start button here on the right and a drive select button here on the left, which on this faster 620 PS model has an additional performance controller just below for activating extra dry, wet or snow driving sub-modes. A key design difference not only over obvious rivals but over most modern cars is the absence of a center dash infotainment screen. Now instead, where that would usually be, uh, you get this large twin segmented air vent with vertical louvers that are supposed to reference the air intake of a race car. Uh, this fishing is positioned above three cylindrical uh, chrome trimmed climate control dials that are modeled on the look of aircraft jet turbines. As for all the infotainment functionality, well, as with uh, Ingolstadt's humbler TT sports car, that's all been relocated to what we're supposed to call the Audi virtual cockpit. That's a 12.3 inch high resolution instrument binnacle display, which completely replaces the usual set of conventional dials. As with the TT, pressing a view button on the steering wheel enables you to toggle between various different virtual cockpit options. Uh, the classic view gives you a prominent speedo and rev counter, while uh, an alternative infotainment view will bring functions like this navigation map to the fore instead. R8 V10 performance drivers get a third performance viewing option, uh, which sees a large central rev counter dominating the center of this screen, uh, around which you can configure in various smaller virtual gauges, including a G-meter, a lap timer, and various readouts that update you on things like uh, temperatures and tire pressures. Whatever virtual cockpit setting uh, you end up choosing, Telephone, media, trip and car settings can be dealt with by voice control. Uh, they can be handled from steering wheel buttons or covered by fiddling with the uh, touch sensitive central MMI controller just below the gear stick here. Uh, you can deal with audio functionality this way too, which in this particular case allows control of an optional and glorious sounding 13 speaker Bang & Olufsen advanced sound system. 
not everything's perfect, of course. Uh, the whole virtual cockpit concept carries with it the disadvantage that the front seat passenger can no longer reach the stereo system. Uh, well, in theory, they can't anyway. Actually, if you peruse the handbook, it'll reveal that there's the option of tracing commands with your fingertips on the surface of this uh, silver-trimmed rotary MMI infotainment system dial that you'll find on the center console just behind the gear stick here. Other issues, well, they're really down to niggly things. The heartbeat sound uh, that, uh, that this R8 insists on delivering when you power off is simply annoying. And we don't much like these rather small, slightly cheap feeling steering wheel paddle shifters, which is disappointing because these are, after all, one of your most important points of interaction with the car. Trimming mistakes of that sort are otherwise notable by their absence. Stainless steel pedals are standard, as is the Nappa leather upholstery that features both on the standard model sport seats and on this performance variant's grippier race style bucket chairs. Either way, diamond stitching can be added as a finishing touch. As a further option, you can extend the Nappa hide across the dashboard and the door cards with or without contrast colored stitching. And on this performance variant, uh, the cabin of which is distinguished by these gloss carbon inlays, there is the option of specifying a lovely Alcantara headliner. As for rear visibility, well, although the rear window on this coupe model is small, uh, the R8 isn't that difficult to see out of by super sports car standards. Plus, all-round parking sensors and a rear view camera come as standard. Uh, with regard to other practicalities, well, there's more than you might expect in terms of cabin storage with a big glove box, which compensates to some extent for those tiny door pockets. Uh, the twin cup holders that you'd have to do without in this car's Lamborghini cousin are here. Uh, present and correct in this lidded compartment between the seats. Uh, plus there is a key slot just to the left of this lovely aircraft style gear stick. And there's a storage space ahead of it which includes USB connections, an aux in point and a 12 volt socket. And beyond that, well, were we to be graduating into this car from a 911, we'd miss the little rear seats that Porsche gives you there. They're so useful for chucking a jacket or a designer shopping bag onto. Now, Audi's tried to compensate by providing a 226 litre space behind the seats that it claims is large enough to accommodate a golf bag. Well, it'd have to be a fairly small one. Uh, the optional storage pack gives you these useful nets behind those seats. You're certainly not going to fit anything like a golf bag in the boot. Uh, given that huge engine display out back, the luggage bay, as in the 911, is at the front. At 112 litres in size, it's not very big at all. And further precious cubic inches are occupied by a bag for the tyre repair kit that Audi provides in lieu of a spare wheel. Uh, a couple of overnight bags or a carry-on travel case would probably fit, but not a lot else. To be fair, the 132 litre boot beneath the bonnet of the 911 isn't much bigger, but it's also true that a comparable mid-engine McLaren model gives you about 30% more space, and more than that if you go for a 570 GT. Plus, of course, front engine rivals like the Mercedes AMG GT Coupe and the Aston Martin Vantage are vastly more practical. To enable R8 owners to make good use of the little space that they do have, the optional storage pack we just mentioned also includes these useful side nets. If you know anything about R8s, then you'll probably remember that the original first generation Type 42 version was marketed rather differently from this Mark II model, targeting more affordable versions of Porsche's 911 in the 70 to 90 thousand pound bracket. Uh, when the Volkswagen Group bought out Porsche in 2012 though, making the 911 a relative rather than a rival, that approach inevitably changed. As a result, base Carrera versions of that 911 are these days now a stepping stone towards the second generation Type 4 SR8, a car that is now firmly price positioned in six-figure territory. 
as it always has with the R8. Audi offers both coupe and open top spider derivatives of this car. Uh, the fixed roof variant is our focus point here. Now, when this second generation Type 4S design first arrived in 2015, uh, the previous model's entry level V8 engine and manual gearbox options were both abandoned. Uh, the focus shifting to just two versions of the company's aggressively melodic 5.2 litre normally aspirated V10, which is what continues to be offered here. It's a unit this Audi Sport GmbH engineered model shares with its Santagata cousin, Lamborghini's Huracan, and it's only offered mated to a seven speed S-Tronic paddle shift auto gearbox. Uh, from the launch of the refreshed version of this Mark II Model R8, Audi was asking from just over £128,000 for the standard 570 PS version of this coupe model with a premium of £8,690 necessary to get the alternative spider body style. In both cases, a £13,000 premium is necessary to upgrade to the 620 PS performance model that we're trying here. Uh, now, if it is the performance version that you want and you're really absolutely determined to spend more on your R8, then your Audi Center will also tell you about the Carbon Black Pack, which is available on this top derivative for an extra £12,900. Uh, for Coupe R8 performance buyers, uh, there's even a really exclusive Decenium limited edition car, which uh, celebrated a decade of V10 engine production and cost nearly £172,000. Now, we use the past tense because you'll struggle to find one now, just 10 examples of that version having been earmarked for our market. The bottom line is that nearly all R8s are sold in the 130 to £150,000 bracket, and that pitches this car directly against some very desirable rivals indeed. Now, we'll start at the bottom end of that pricing spectrum and focus on the standard R8 Coupe 570 PS model. Now, sure, you could save just over £7,000 on one of those and get yourself an Aston Martin Vantage, but that contender has only 510 PS, or you could pay just over £4,000 more than is needed for a base fixed top R8 and get that Aston's 4 litre V8 engine in a 557 PS state of tune in a Mercedes AMG GTC coupe. A £9,000 premium over a base R8 coupe would get you McLaren's most affordable model, uh, the 540 PS 540C and a Porsche 911 Turbo that's also in the same pricing ballpark. Now those are your most obvious choices, but in theory there are other cars that you could look at in this part of the coupe super sports car sector. If you don't need really sharp handling, then you might want to consider paying slightly more for the 550 PS 4 litre V8 version of the Bentley Continental GT. And if you're not fussed about having an exotic badge, then you might want to consider uh, either the BMW M8 Competition Coupe that has uh, 624 PS and it costs around £124,000, or the Jaguar F Type SVR, which has 575 PS and costs around £114,000. Let's move on to consider the price positioning of the uprated 620 PS R8 performance model that we're testing here. Now earlier we briefed you on the premium you'll pay for this quicker R8 variant. That means an asking price of just over £141,000 for this coupe body style. Now that lifts this Audi most directly into contention with two obvious rivals, both pitched at about £150,000. One is less day-to-day -day usable, but it's arguably more raw and exciting, the 570 PS McLaren 570S. Uh, the other is more day-to-day -day usable, but it's also more of a GT Cruiser, the Aston Martin DB11 V8, a car with 510 PS. Around £150,000 also buys you the 583 PS Honda NSX. That's an appealing car, but it's one hobbled by its lower quality cabin and by the weight of its hybrid mechanicals. Uh, the Porsche 911 Turbo S is also in the same pricing and performance ballpark, as is the Mercedes AMG GTR, which costs just over £148,000 and offers 593 PS. 
a weighty Bentley Continental GT W12 Coupe with 635 PS, costs around 160,000. And if you're wondering about the Lamborghini Huracan, which shares virtually all the engineering with this R8, well, that's much more expensive. Uh, the least expensive Huracan Evo model, which is fitted out with the 640 PS version of this Audi's V10 engine, that costs from around 206,000 pounds. There, we've briefed you on the super sports car market landscape that this Audi competes upon, and no doubt you've got the idea, namely that there's certainly plenty of super sports car competition for this R8, but there's nothing else that's quite the same, especially if you factor in the aural magnificence of a higher revving, normally aspirated engine, and that's something that none of the competitive models I just mentioned can offer. If, having reviewed what's available and spent a very pleasant few weeks testing the key contenders, you find yourself falling under this Audi spell, then the deal might well be sealed Ingolstadt's way by a convincing standard specification. So let's take a look at what you get and let's start with the standard 570 PS V10 model. As well as 19-inch, five-arm, twin-spoke design forged wheels with gloss black calipers and full LED headlights, buyers get auto headlamps and wipers, all-round parking sensors, heat-insulating glass, power-folding mirrors and LED tail lamps with dynamic scrolling indicators. Plus, there's dual-branch chrome-plated oval tailpipes, preparation for a tracking system, an alarm and a choice of solid, metallic or pearl effect paint finishes. The coupe gets a retractable rear spoiler too, while with the Spider, there's a fully automatic hood offered in either black, brown or red. As for driving stuff, well, in addition to quattro four-wheel drive and seven-speed S-Tronic dual-clutch paddle shift automatic transmission, there's sports suspension and the Audi Drive Select dynamic handling setup. So you can set up the throttle, the steering, the gear shift and the stability system responses to exactly suit the way that you want to drive. Inside, there's a flat-bottomed, three-spoke performance leather steering wheel, uh, climate-controlled air conditioning, stainless steel pedals, a reversing camera, and an auto-dimming rear-view mirror. Uh, the grippy sport seats feature fine Nappa leather trim, powered adjustment, heating, and pneumatic seat backrest and bolster adjustment. Plus, you get an interior light pack that offers subtle LED cabin illumination and even lighting around the rear engine compartment. Plenty of infotainment technology comes included too, courtesy of the brand's top MMI Navigation Plus with Audi Connect infotainment system. And that's integrated neatly into the standard 12.3-inch Audi Virtual Cockpit Instrument Binnacle Display, which uh, takes the place of a center dash monitor. Uh, the MMI package includes sat-nav, a DVD drive, the useful Audi Music interface, a 10-gigabyte flash memory for music data, two SD card readers, uh, text-to-speak messaging and a DAB radio playing through the five speakers of the Audi sound system. Plus there's the Audi phone box package with wireless charging and a Bluetooth interface complemented by three microphones integrated into the seat belts so that when you make calls on the move, uh, the recipients will be able to hear you over the roar of that thumping 5.2 litre V10 throbbing away behind. That MMI infotainment package also comes with a three-year subscription to Audi Connect online infotainment services operated by a data transmission module that lets the driver network with the internet and uses the superfast LTE, that's long-term evolution network. Uh, the central component here is mobile phone preparation. Uh, the Connect setup with uh, seamlessly interface with your mobile to provide an internet connection and allow passengers to conveniently surf and email with up to eight mobile devices via an integrated WLAN or wireless local area network hotspot. Audi Connect also brings you features such as navigation with images from Google Earth, uh, Google points of interest search by voice control and Google Street View. Connect further adds the uh, Audi music stream system with web radio, plus access to social media services like Facebook and Twitter. Uh, there is also Audi online traffic information, which takes the movement data from the thousands of smartphones and navigation units that are traveling on the road and can inform you of route-based likely average speeds, predicted journey times and recommended reroutes. 
So that's what comes as standard on the base 570 PS V10 Quattro R8. Is it worth finding the substantial £13,000 premium necessary to upgrade to this 620 PS performance version? Well, we can see why you might be tempted if funds permit. As well as the extra power, that heftier asking price gets you a meaner look uh, thanks to a larger 20-inch 10-spoke wide design forged wheels and a matte titanium styling pack which adds that finishing at the front to the grille, the air inlets and the spoiler lip, at the rear to the diffuser and at the side to the mirror housings and the side blades. At this level on the range, you also get a fixed rather than a retractable spoiler, and that's finished in gloss carbon and gloss black oval tailpipe trims. And you get a standard a set of track-ready carbon ceramic brakes with their Audi-branded anthracite-coloured calipers. Inside, buyers of this performance variant will enjoy a pair of shell-backed race-style bucket seats with embossed headrests, uh, these being upgraded chairs that would add £3,000 to the cost of the standard derivative. Uh, plus, there are extended inlays in gloss carbon and a high beam assist feature for the headlights. Nappa leather trim features not only on the seats but also on the knee pads, uh, the doors and the upper part of the centre console. And perhaps more importantly, the asking figure also includes an extra performance drive mode uh, with wet, dry and snow options that functions as part of the Audi Drive Select Vehicle Dynamic System. Annoyingly though, on a performance model, uh, the fuel tank size falls from 83 to 73 litres. As mentioned earlier, R8 performance model buyers will be offered the option of paying extra for a carbon black pack, which includes a range of niceties that buyers of this car tend to want. Uh, as the pack name suggests, there's a carbon finish for the front spoiler, uh, for the rocker panel and the rear diffuser. Plus, you also get carbon finishing for the side blades, the door mirror housings and for the engine cover. Uh, the ceramic brakes get evocative red calipers, a gloss black exterior styling pack, gives the badge work a gloss black finish and the 20 inch wheels are fashioned from milled aluminium and feature a five twin spoke dynamic design with gloss anthracite black finishing. Uh, Audi magnetic ride adaptive damping, now that is thrown in with this pack too, as is a CFRP, that's carbon fibre reinforced plastic stabiliser, and it reduces weight and at the same time stiffens the spring and damper combination, and that gives you more direct contact with the road and sportier handling. Earlier, we also mentioned the exclusive Decanium version of this performance coupe model. Uh, only 222 of these limited edition variants will be sold globally, and those cars are most obviously identifiable by a unique Daytona grey paint finish and bronze matte finishing for the 20-inch five twin-spoke dynamic wheel rims and the engine cover. Uh, as with a carbon black pack model, the Decanium variant gives you extensive areas of carbon exterior detailing, uh, the gloss black exterior styling pack and Audi magnetic ride adaptive damping. Plus with this special edition you also get piercing Audi laser light headlights and more responsive dynamic steering. The cabin is further upgraded with Alcantara trim for the steering wheel and the headliner, an extended fine Nappa leather package and copper coloured contrast seat stitching. Plus there's a Bang & Olufsen sound system, a useful interior storage pack and puddle lights that display at night with the Decanium logo and the specific edition number of your car. A time to consider options that are available to R8 buyers across the range. On standard V10 and V10 performance models, we really think that you need to add in the Audi Magnetic Ride Package. Uh, now, some writers have questioned whether this adaptive suspension setup is really worth paying extra for, but all that they've probably done is thrash this car around a smooth racetrack on a press launch. Many likely owners will be using their R8s every day, and for such regular regular use is that the option of being able to switch the ride into a comfort orientated mode via the drive select system will be a very welcome one indeed, especially given the firmness of the standard passive setup. Uh, unfortunately though, the only way of ordering that upgraded damping system on an R8 these days is to pay the £3,500 premium that Audi demands for its comfort and sound package. Now that also gives you an extended fine Nappa leather package, uh, illuminated door cells and a premium Bang & Olufsen sound system. 
The latter audio setup can be ordered separately too, and it offers 13 speakers, 550 watts, a 16 channel amplifier, a subwoofer, and LED accent speaker lighting. With the comfort and sound package fitted, you'll also be offered the option of paying more for contrast Nappa leather stitching in silver, blue, grey, red, or yellow. As mentioned earlier, on the standard V10 variant, you can add the performance model's race-style bucket seats, or you can stick with the ordinary sport-style chairs and have them trimmed with diamond stitching. Plus, uh, base model R8 buyers can also specify piano black interior inlays. On a performance model, you'll be offered the option of adding in an Alcantara headlining in black, lunar silver, or parchment beige, all shades available with or without diamond stitching. And both V10 and V10 performance derivatives can be specified with red brake calipers, Ara Blue crystal effect paint, a matte paint finish, uh, various exclusive customized exterior paint shades, and a gloss anthracite black finish for the wheels. On a V10 performance variant, you can also specify the different five twin spoke dynamic design for the car's 20 inch wheel rims. Uh, we've got that here with a Titan Optic matte finish. What else? Uh, well, we think you're going to really need the storage package that gives you nets behind the front seats and at the sides of the luggage department. Uh, and you might also want to pay for the factory collection package that will fly you to the German Neckersommel factory to see your car being hand built prior to your being able to drive it home. Uh, finally, at the time of this test, Audi was also promising in future to offer the improved dynamic steering system from the R8 Decennium as an option on lesser R8s. Uh, now, to be frank, we're not convinced by this system, which is a pity because the electric steering isn't this car's strongest point, and it would be nice if that optional setup improved it. Unfortunately, many feel, as we do, that the variable speed sensitive assistance of the dynamic package fails to do that so try before you buy is our advice. Uh, let's finish this section by talking about safety. Now one surprise here is that Audi has chosen not to equip this car with the kind of cutting edge camera based safety features now becoming commonplace on much humbler cars. Uh, for example one of those autonomous braking setups that scans the road ahead for potential accident hazards and will help you to brake to avoid them. Uh, the English that brand makes the excuse that cars of this kind are all about lightweight and that adding those kinds of features would hurt the R8 on the scale. For us, that's a poor excuse. I mean, these are electronic rather than mechanical systems after all. Uh, every Porsche 911 now includes autonomous braking, and the R8 ought to as well. To be fair to Audi, you don't get this kind of tech in rival Aston Martin or McLaren models, but that's no reason for not fitting it here. It's not very Vorsprung Dirk Technik. Even the most basic autonomous driving features, uh, adaptive cruise control, for example, are missing too. What you do get are all the usual basic electronic aids for braking, traction and stability control, including an ESC system that includes torque vectoring for sharper corner turning. Plus, as you'd expect, you get twin front and side airbags, although not curtain airbags. It's odd that Audi, one of the earliest adopters of turbocharging, is one of the very last brands to relinquish normal aspiration in this particular sector. Now we've talked of the aural advantages of avoiding forced induction elsewhere in this film, but the inevitable downside, of course, is a set of efficiency stats way off what you get from comparable turbocharged super sport sector rivals. WLTP rated combined cycle fuel economy is rated at 21.6 mpg for the standard R8 model and 21.4 mpg for this performance variant. To give you some perspective on that, uh, with a McLaren 570S or an Aston Martin DB11 V8, you'd be looking at around 28 mpg. To be fair, other rivals do come closer to this Audi's mark. A Mercedes AMG GTC Coupe, for instance, manages this 22.1 mpg. Either way, there will be a frequent need to brush your brogues on your local filling station's tarmac, particularly in this performance model. And that's courtesy of an unfortunate decision in pursuit of a, frankly, inconsequential weight saving to reduce the size of the fuel tank to 73 litres. That's down from the 83 litre capacity that you get in the standard version. 
The CO2 stats that'll determine your tax status aren't much to write home about either, despite the inclusion of a particulate filter on both versions of the V10 for this uprated model. The figures see the base model rated at 293 grams per kilometer and this performance derivative at 298 grams per kilometer. You can only imagine how bad those returns would have been had not the company adopted its cylinder on demand technology for this power plant at the original launch of this Mark II Type 4S model. Uh, when one of the upper gears is engaged, this shuts down the cylinders on either the left or the right bank of the engine. And that means that at low speeds, when you're driving off throttle, uh, you'll probably be at the wheel of a V5 rather than a V10 R8. There's more too at under 34 miles an hour when the drive select driving mode setup is operating in its comfort setting. The S-Tronic auto gearbox switches over to freewheeling operation when you release the accelerator pedal and that leaves the car to coast until you touch the throttle again. Plus, when you brake the car temporarily from low speeds, uh, let's say in traffic or at the lights, there's a stop-start system to cut the engine. Uh, Audi is also keen to remind us of the weight reductions which have been made to this second generation model uh, at its original launch back in 2015. Uh, those saved 32 kilos thanks to the adoption of CFRP, carbon fiber reinforced polymer within the space frame chassis. This material is easier to recycle than conventional metals and along with the more efficient engineering will, Audi says, allow this car to cut its greenhouse gas emissions by 2.6 tonnes over its lifetime in comparison with the original first generation Type 42 series R8 model. An all-electric e-tron version of that car was developed but unfortunately uh, the technology never made it to an R8 production model and now it never will. What else? Um, well, you'll be able to get your R8 serviced at any Audi dealership and there's a choice of fixed or flexible plans depending on whether you cover more or less than uh, 10,000 miles a year. Either way, an inspection service is required at 19,000 miles or when you reach two years of ownership. Uh, as for ongoing use, well, the fixed plan requires an oil change every 9,000 miles while the flexible plan uh, requires an oil change every 19,000 miles or every two years years, whichever comes around first. Either way, maintenance will be expensive. We'd expect three services on the car uh, to set you back around £3,500. We're slightly disappointed by the three-year 60,000 mile warranty though, particularly given that the mechanically identical and supposedly more temperamental Lamborghini Huracan comes with a four-year unlimited mileage package. Uh, the three-year deal that you get with equivalent McLaren and Porsche models, uh, that is also an unlimited mileage deal too. As an option, your Audi Center will sell you a four-year 75,000 mile warranty package or one that lasts for five years and 90,000 miles. On to residuals, uh, with only around 30 cars each day being hand-built at Audi's Heilbronn factory, uh, there's enough rarity value about this R8 to keep residuals buoyant. Uh, expect depreciation to be a fraction behind that of a Porsche 911, but well ahead of something like BMW's i8. Industry experts cap reckon that after three years or 36,000 miles, a uh, standard V10 coupe will still be worth £62,500 or 50% uh, of its original value. For this V10 performance variant, the figure is 70,800 or 51 percent of its original value. Finally, insurance premiums will be as high as they inevitably are for any supercar and they're rated at a top of the shop Group 50E. The appeal of this Type 4S second generation R8 has a lot to do with its engine. So it's just as well for Audi that the 5.2 litre V10 is such a glorious power plant. It reminds you that normal aspiration produces a level of r entertainment that a turbo unit can never quite match. We're really gonna miss it when it finally disappears. This R8's also old style in less positive ways in terms of its camera-driven safety and autonomous driving technology, for example, of which there's hardly any, which does put it at a disadvantage to the eighth generation Porsche 911 that Audi must have had an eye on when they were updating this Type uh, 4S R8 model. 
Still, the changes made to the suspension, the power output, the steering and the drive modes are worthwhile. And the styling updates give this car a little extra pavement presence. Otherwise, it's as you were when it comes to this second generation version of this model. This R8 may not have quite the rarefied appeal of some of its exotic rivals, but in most meaningful respects, it can match them car for car sit inside and it's impossible not to be impressed by the virtual cockpit instrument layout with its myriad of purposeful looking buttons that hang off the steering wheel just begging to be prodded. Then there's the general build quality which is all soft buttery leathers and cool turned aluminium finishes. Unlike a McLaren and Aston Martin or indeed a similarly engined Lamborghini, the build feels bulletproof. And unlike a more powerful Porsche 911, an R8 really makes a six-figure statement. Audi has clearly benchmarked key competitors and blended Latin exclusivity with Teutonic day-to-day -day usability, creating a finished product that's difficult to beat if you want a car of this kind that you could drive every day. But does this second generation R8 have quite the charm of the original? Maybe not. But then to some extent, that is the price of progress. And it's quite a hefty price in this case. For hardcore enthusiasts, Audi could doubtless bring us a stripped out, more focused race style version. Indeed, in the R8 LMS competition model, it already does. But that would be a vanity product rather than a relevant one. So we'll take this R8 as it is, loving its looks, its classic configuration and its determination to stick with melodic, normally aspirated power. It's a very Audi supercar and there is nothing quite like it.